Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm looking to see if I can see all of your bright, shiny faces. I'm hoping you can see us. I'm not seeing anyone else yet, but hopefully um, everyone's live. Good evening. I'm Lori Burrows, and I'm here to welcome you. Ellen, I can't see anyone else. If there's a chat feature, someone can tell me in the chat whether they can see us. I'm going to check. In my okay, now I'm seeing people popping in. So great. We'd love it if you won't be on screen the whole time, but we'd love it if you would take this first couple of minutes and turn your videos on so we can see you. Um, we have some amazing speakers tonight, and it's a little awkward to be talking to an iPad or a computer or a camera, so we'd love to know that we're talking to real humans out there. So those of you who are joining us, thank you. I see Gregory, you turned on your camera. Thank you for that. Uh, we see Garth Martin turned on his camera. We see uh, Catherine's waving, so thank you for doing that. It's nice to see all of you out there in cyberspace and help us make sure that we feel connected even in this time when we're all having to stay home. Billy, hey, good to see you. Thanks for joining. So, yeah, we're going to, they're going to, those of you who did turn on your cameras, thank you for that smile. Um, Ellen uh, Kornblatt, who's the Director of, of Engagement at the museum, is scrolling through and taking pictures because, of course, if we don't post it on social media, this didn't happen. So, she's taking some pictures. So, I'm going to go ahead and get the program started because we, as you all know, if you've joined us before for one of these, we start, we start at 7 a.m., uh, 7 p.m. sharp, and we try to finish no later than 8 p.m. sharp because we realize you're taking time out of your evening, but we're glad you all joined us. For those of you who just now got on, my name is Lori Burroughs, and I'm a volunteer for the museum. I serve on the foundation board. I'm the president of the foundation board, and the Historic Arkansas Museum Foundation is a separate 501c3 whose job it is to raise money to support Historic Arkansas Museum. And one of the programs that we offer is this History of Serve Center C series. And we're really glad that you joined us for another curbside edition of History is Served. And around the museum, we call it HAM for Historic Arkansas Museum. And specifically, we call people who love HAM, like we all do, the Hamily. And many of you joining tonight, I've looked at the list. We know several of you are already members of the Hamily. But if you're not a member of the Hamily, we really encourage you to join. Get, go to historicarkansas.org, historicarkansas.org, and you can join there. You can donate online, and your support will go. Hold on, we've got it. We're, we're uh, trying to. We're trying to so, but your support will. But your support will. Be meetings just like this, these events, which are so important to showcase the heritage of Arkansas, the state we love and live in. So we're going to now, it's my extraordinary privilege to talk to you about what our program is going to be like tonight. You all should have gotten a little primer of that in your bags when you picked them up, when you got your meal tonight. And I'm thrilled that we have three speakers. We're going to first hear from Chef C.C. Key, who prepared the meal tonight. Um, she even did a vegetarian option, and so my family got to enjoy that too. And if you haven't eaten your dinner yet, I can tell you you're going to love it. Those egg rolls were out of this world. And then she's also going to talk to us about how she created this menu and what inspired her. And then next we have joining us from D.C. We're really glad he's here. Thanks to the power of the virtual space, we were able to get him tonight. We've got Kevin Kim. He's going to talk about the history of the Chinese American community in the Arkansas Delta. So we're really glad to have him here. And then our final speaker is going to be Mayor Jodan Yi, and he's going to talk about his family in the Chinese American community today. So we'll hear from each of our speakers. You will have the chance at the end of their, their prepared remarks to ask questions. And so please take advantage of that. We'll do a short Q&A. We, we have some amazing people here, and we want you to be able to ask them questions if you have them. You can also use the chat feature throughout the Zoom tonight to ask questions that you have, and we'll be sure and get those answers to you. So I am really excited to hear first from our chef. We got to chat a little before all of you got to join us, and I know she took great pride and took very seriously the menu for this evening, and as we all know, it was delicious. So we're really glad to have Chef Cece Key here. She's formerly of Southern Gourmetian. And many of you in Little Rock, if you're doing this tonight, you're probably a foodie. And if you're a foodie, Southern Gourmetian is not foreign to you. As you know, it started out as a food truck and then became a brick and mortar. And even since it closed, it still has a huge cult following. And I'm part of that cult. That grilled kimchi was one of my favorite foods I've ever eaten. 
that restaurant took Delta Fusion food, which is what you're eating tonight, and made it into a modern meal that reflects how cultures collided in the kitchens of the Delta. So I'm going to turn it over to Chef Key now to tell us more about the dishes she prepared and her inspiration. So Chef Key, I, you're not on my screen. I hope we didn't lose the connection, but I hope you're still there. And if so, it, it's your turn to tell us all about what you worked so hard to make, make for us this evening. Did we lose her? Oh, there she is. She's sideways, but she's on screen. <laughs> and we can't hear. You're muted, Chef Key. Here. Yeah, we'll see if we can all just look sideways. There you go. Now get it turned and then we'll be set. Let's see. Okay, we're getting close. Hold on. There's part for those of you who've been to the museum. That's in the second floor up there where we like to have our events like the pie party and other things we do. Okay, now you're right side up. Let's hey, check guys, the mute. We can hear you. So it's all yours, Chef Key. Thanks so much. Awesome. Okay, look, I'm sorry, y'all. I, I don't know. Andrew set me up and then we got disconnected. So I got You're here. fine. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yes, everything that Lori said is absolutely true. Um, I am so honored to be able to do this for you guys tonight. It's been quite some time since I fixed the four course meal for 85 people. And so it was uh, definitely a blast <laughs> and it got a little rough in here, but we made it through. Um, tonight's meal for me was especially easy to make. I have uh, actually, of course, from running Southern Formation and just being a complete food and history nerd, I have studied thoroughly the, uh, the effects of the Chinese community in the Arkansas Delta, Mississippi Delta area before. So this kind of was super familiar, really, honestly. Um, tonight's meal, I wanted to really try to tap into everything that is both Southern and Asian. Um, that first course with the egg roll, that was a complete combined, well, really, and the thing too, honestly, about Southern and Asian foods that I like to mix together so well is that they have a lot in common. So it's really easy to do. Um, those pickled carrots and daikon in there, I pickled it quite some time ago, honestly, so we could get a true pickling to it. That cabbage in there, so it, of course was vegetarian. I wanted to keep that that way and have it light. Um, those egg rolls are a little different from your traditional Chinese restaurant egg roll. Um, it's a little more crispy than, and, and a little smaller, um, but that was kind of in, in course of keeping it light. The second course, we, uh, I smoked that chicken that was in that wonton that was stuffed and, and kept that broth super light, trying to hopefully get that smoke flavor to shine through. It was a little more difficult than I had anticipated. But um, once again, taking smokiness smoking something that's truly southern and putting it inside of a wonton and making wonton soup with that for my vegetarians you guys got mushrooms for your wonton <laughs> but um that third course um super traditional with the rice that was a complete sticky rice that um that is, is all too familiar within chinese and asian cultures that barbecue is where it got a little more southern than asian um if you guys are familiar at all with Chinese char siu or char siu pork, barbecue pork, it is um, honestly super easy to combine that and make a, a more Southern style barbecue sauce, which is what I was trying to kind of go for there. Make something really rich, less sticky. Um, Chinese barbecue, can it, it is known to be sticky, and I wanted to kind of get rid of that part and bring in the southern aspect of making it really kind of thick and, and like I said, more, more southern. Um, those greens, I used uh, garlic, and, and instead of what I would normally put in bacon and hot sauce for my greens, of course, using garlic, using hoisin, a uh, little bit of ginger, taking chicken broth and, and mixing that ginger and green onion in there to, to stew those greens. Um, I kind of wanted that to be like what you would kind of expect at a barbecue restaurant almost um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of combine that together with the, the Asian feel because um, I wanted it to look like a barbecue plate, honestly. 
um, that last course, super easy. Um, it is pretty much a super throwback to my childhood. Uh, my mom was in college for a large part of my childhood, so we ate at a Chinese buffet right across the street from UALR. And I was like, I have to do the biscuits. Um, and when I was making them for uh, my family before we did this, they were like, oh my God, like these are, I threw in a little uh, Chinese five spice powder into that sugar to kind of give it just a little something else. Um, and it's not, and that wasn't a white sugar. Um, I don't use white sugar actually. Um, and so that was a, a Zofa sugar. And so there was just a little, once again, a little something else, a little different, but super familiar, super, super familiar if you've gone to the Chinese buffet. Um, and I kind of wanted to just kind of give a nod to my childhood and a nod to spending lots of time at a Chinese buffet. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was basically it. I literally wanted to kind of keep that Southern Gourmetian thing of literally taking these two cultures and just blending them together in any way possible. Um, I did it for about five years working next to Chef Patterson. Um, so I, I, like I said, I truly enjoyed doing this for you guys tonight. It was an amazing time. I set off the fire alarm here with no fire. It was great. We have a lot going on. So once again, thank you guys for the opportunity and I hope everyone enjoyed the meal. Thank you so much, Chef. Can you hear me? I want yes. to try to mute. Okay, great. Uh, well, we're gonna, we had several people comment in the chat. They can also use the Q&A feature, but I know you're probably tired, but if we might have a couple of questions for you. And so I'm gonna look, I'm trying to okay. switch by monitoring the chat. And also by um, seeing if we had any questions. Several, the meal is fantastic. Marcella said the meal is fantastic and miss you. And then uh, Ian said it was all delicious. Does anyone have any questions for our chef tonight? I love, thank you. I remember that Chinese food buffet too. My family ate there as well. So <laughs> <laughs> great memory. And you did a great job of fusing it all together. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm not, well, let's see. Uh, someone asked, where, where did you, that's a great question. Where did you learn to cook? Um, actually, my mom loves to tell the story of me being four years old and wanting a play kitchen more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, being outside, doing the whole mud pies. I would take tree bark and like shred this tree bark out and make it look like chicken mm -hmm. and cook mm -hmm. greens. So I've been cooking greens <laughs> before I could cook greens. Um, so I literally grew up learning how to cook. It was just innate, honestly. I wanted to do it. My great grandmother was a huge influence in that. It was kind of her love language. She didn't have a lot to offer, but she always had something to eat. And so I kind of wanted to be that person. When you come to my house, there's always something to eat. And so I learned it just growing up. That is something I think every Southerner can relate to is growing up, <laughs> particularly with grandmas. Is right. there, this is a great question. Um, Joseph asked, where can we get your food now? Honestly, um, I've just been having people contact me directly. Um, you guys are more than welcome to follow me um, personally on Facebook. My name is Satera. It's C-E-T-E-R-A. And then the C-C is in the middle. P K E Y. I accept everyone's friend requests because I have so many, of course, <laughs> so many customers and I try to keep in touch because I have a huge, 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 huge like relationship with a lot of my customers. I, I love, love, love people uh, more than anything almost. So I love being in touch with you guys. I love people knowing me personally. I cook all the time, literally. I'm getting ready to start cooking for Thanksgiving and holidays for people since they're going to be at home. <laughs> so please follow me and, and I'll, I'll definitely get back to you. And we can, um, we can drop your, uh, how, your name, spell it correctly, and put that in the chat feature for people who might want to, for the visual learners among us rather than the auditory. I'm a visual <laughs> right. Yeah, but one last question, we'll close on, Chef, and then you can maybe go take a deep breath and give yourself a break after working right. so hard today, oh is God. what's your favorite thing to make? I'm a Southern girl through and through. I am almost as country as they come. 
Um, I absolutely love dressing, candy yams, greens, mac and cheese. That's my favorite meal of all time. I could eat it. I eat it way more often than a lot of people do. They're like, are you really making dressing, cornbread dressing right now? It's not Thanksgiving. I make it all the time. <laughs> it is my favorite. So that is, that's my go-to meal for myself. But I make it all. I love Mexican. I make carnitas tacos all the time. Like, I cook everything. So <laughs> I love food way too much. Clearly, you have a love for food, and it's good. <laughs> I have quite a talent with it, too. Chef, Thank we are so you. grateful for, your, for your, the way you poured yourself in tonight's meal and then the way that you shared with us today, tonight as well. We've learned a lot more about you. And thank you so much for your time tonight. No problem at all. It was an honor, you guys. Thank y'all so much. And we're going to we're gonna get you some more followers on social media. And it sounds yeah, like... Yeah, uh, y'all follow me. I was looking <laughs> forward to it. Yes, we're going to get you followed. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> no problem. Good night, everybody. Good night. And we had several people post thank you very much in the chat feature to the chef. So no thank you again. So now before we go into our next two speakers, I want to point out some additional resources on the topics that we just discussed. You all got a gift bag tonight when you picked up your food. And so with it in there was a hand read handout written by our Arkansas made research at part of the Hamily um, researcher, Victoria Garrett. And there's some history and a few recipes too. So be sure and don't miss those. That was in your handout. There's also some stories and remembrances written by Ju Foon, I hope I pronounced the first name correctly, who grew up in Forest City. Foon's a writer, a reporter, a singer, a, gu a guitarist, a drummer, a retired engineering manager, a stockbroker, and a diehard Razorback fan. <laughs> and we thank him for sharing with us and giving permission for us to share them all with you in your gift bags tonight. We're also, um, Ellen has already done this. She put a link in the chat box to a presentation that Mr. Foon gave previously for the Arkansas State Archives. So we encourage you, there's a YouTube link there. Try to pull it out of the chat and open it up and so you can watch it later. And he tells about his personal family history. It's a powerful story and we hope you'll take the time to watch. And now it's my great pleasure, uh, Kevin, you're up next to introduce our tonight's featured speakers. As I mentioned earlier, there's the mayor. Um, Kevin, you're, we're going to go with you first. Kevin Kim, who's joining, as I mentioned earlier, from the East Coast, was born in South Korea. He was raised in Los Angeles, but he likes to say he was breaded and deep fried in Little Rock, Arkansas, where he graduated from high school. Kevin's currently a researcher in Asian Pacific American Foodways with the Smithsonian's and a costume community museum in Washington, D.C. He's also a doctoral candidate at the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland, where he teaches courses on material culture and popular culture in America. His research interests focus on the cultural politics of food in American life, and he has a special emphasis on Asian American foodways, which means you all know why we have him here tonight. He's been featured on National Public Radio, The Atlantic, The Smithsonian Magazine, and Delish. And in 2015, Kevin was awarded a Park Break Fellowship in Cultural Resources Management from the George Wright Society for his curatorial work. Kevin is a graduate of Swarthmore College with a BA and with honors in history. Kevin's going to speak to us tonight, and then just like we had with Chef Key, we're going to have the opportunity to ask questions. You can do that through the chat feature, through the Q&A, and we'll be happy to hear from him. So, Kevin, I can't see you on my screen. I hope everyone else can see you, but go ahead, and it's your turn. And we're glad you're here tonight. Thank you. I know you've had a long day. There you are. I see you now. I there know you are. are. Um, long day. We're so glad to have you. Well, thank you so much, Lori, for that uh, introduction, and, and uh, thank you, um, Ellen, and the staff at the Historic Arkansas Museum for um, making this work. I, I, I think people could hear me. Uh, okay, great. If you uh, can hear me, we can hear you fine. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, um, and I just want to thank everyone in the audience uh, for um, spending their evening with, uh, with us and for the Chinese American community for uh, being gracious enough to yeah, invite me to their homes and 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 um, and spend time with them over the years. Um, this is a project that uh, I started in 2008, believe it or not, while I was still at Swarthmore uh, in my undergrad years, and I've since kind of kept in touch with people and 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 added to the research. So I'm going to share um, if I can. Let me go ahead and um, oh, it looks like the host has disabled my screen sharing, but um, if Ellen could turn that on so I could share this little slide with you. 
so I could um, have some visuals with my talk. That would be great. Let's see that. Let's see if I could do that. Uh, or Ellen, if you want to bring up the slide, I can't seem to bring it up on my screen, but uh, if uh, if you could do that, it'd be great. <clears throat> Try now. Oh, there it is. All right. So I think you should be able to see my present my my uh, my screen now. Um, we can. Awesome. Well, um, so as uh, as um, Lori um, has uh, sa uh, has said, um, I uh, was in, uh, invited to give a little context and a little history. Um, as you enjoy the lovely meal that CC Key um, um, has prepared for you for this evening. Um, and I think if we were to sort of summarize um, the history um, of Chinese Americans in Arkansas, I think um, one of my, um, uh, one of the people that I got to interview, Frida Kwan of, of um, Delta State University, um, said that her experience was kind of like Juk Singh, which in Chinese translates into a knot between the bamboo, neither Chinese nor American sort of in between. And I think I'd like to sort of think about the history of Chinese in Arkansas as this sort of push pull of seemingly contradictory ideas. It is a history of exclusion, but also of opportunity, it's of tradition, but also of change and exchange. It's a history of resistance and resilience. And it's also a history um, of golden mountains and golden ventures, and I'll go into detail about what those mean in a little bit. So I think um, in thinking about the Chinese story and history, um, there are certain events and institutions that mark the sort of early history of Chinese to Arkansas. You know, how did Chinese um, get to uh, the state? So an important uh, time period is Reconstruction. And um, the Golden Mountains refers to um, uh, the, uh, what the Chinese called um, Gansam, which was California at the time. And this was during the gold rush of 1849. Well, uh, the Chinese come to Arkansas a little later um, 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 as credit contract workers hired by a consortium of cotton planters in the late 19th century during Reconstruction. Uh, these cotton planters sought a quote unquote docile workforce to replace and dilute political power of African American labor um, at the time, the newly freed um, slave labor. The majority of these first wave of immigrants were from Guangdong, or um, uh, formerly known as Canton. Um, and they got to the cotton fields, but quickly were disillusioned by the harsh treatment and working conditions. And many, because of the fact that they were contract laborers, left their contracts, left the fields. Um, they either went to California or, or um, sort of, or to work on the different railroads that were um, being constructed around the area, like the Texas and Yazoo. Um, but some stayed. Um, so in, 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 in looking at that sort of early history of the reconstruction, you know, I point to uh, examples like this, um, which kind of hard to see, I'm sorry about the image quality. Um, the scan didn't quite <laughs> come out uh, as, clear, uh, as cleanly as I thought it would. Um, this is from the Pine Bluff Weekly, uh, July 8, 1869, um, after a meeting of these cotton planters, um, uh, where they said that they were able to get get labor, quote unquote, in great numbers and at cheap rates, made efficient in the cultivation of cotton and are uh, proof against the malaria, the climate um, of the Delta. Now, uh, the Reconstruction Era governor of Arkansas uh, in his memoirs actually wrote about the more political effects of bringing in Chinese laborers. This is his quote, um, as you could read it on the screen. Um, you know, the Reconstruction era uh, government, in addition to the Chinese, quickly the Chinese laborers themselves quickly realized their their political motives, and that was a, that was one of the um, parts uh, that sort of one of the the reasons why they decided to leave their contracts um, and leave the fields. Some uh, voluntary, but sometimes even by force. So you know, they 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 had some you know. There were some um, records of revolts 
um, during that time. Also, uh, in addition to Reconstruction, another sort of pivotal moment of uh, Chinese American history in Arkansas um, uh, was, of course, the Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act placed severe restrictions on Chinese immigrants coming into the United States and wasn't lifted until 1943 uh, with the passage of the Magnuson Act. But what's interesting about uh, the history of the Exclusion Act um, specific to the Delta Chinese was that there were some key exemptions made in the writing of that act um, that the Delta Chinese took advantage of, and specifically that was um, the loophole for merchants. So merchants were allowed to come in and out um, and to immigrate, um, which some of the Chinese grocery store owners were able to um, take advantage of. Now, in 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 uh, in passage um, uh, of this legislation and, and in the midst of this passage, um, obviously uh, there was a lot of anti-Chinese bias and racism, which was, which was then reflected in the discourse around Chinese food. But again, that push-pull of that history, right? In addition to um, uh, that's, uh, this anti-Chinese bias and racism, which, which led to some really horrific events um, in, in, in the history of Chinese in America. So you think about the pogroms that were happening in, 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 in places like California, there was also a fascination, right, with the, with the quote unquote Orient. Um, it was seen as something that was exotic and, 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 and that was um, even, even um, something to be enjoyed. So here we have a pamphlet from the American Federation of Labor that was um, sort of propping the reasons for Chinese, of the Chinese exclusion, which was published in 1901. Um, here you see this the divide that is set between meat versus rice, right? The othering of, of, of Chinese food and the othering of Chinese people in relation to the foods that they ate. But you have this, um, um, but in 1880, um, you know, again, that push-pull, right? You have this um, article from the Daily Gazette, um, the Daily Arkansas Gazette um, in Little Rock, 1880, that talks about um, the artistry and the craft of Chinese cooking here, uh, the reporter describes delicate dumpling being made. Um, and here he, you know, the, this quote that I pulled um, that sort of illuminates that, you know, it's a, it's a revelation to those who have been educated in the delusion that rats and garbage were the staple of Chinese cuisine. You know, that horrible racism and stereotype that was being pinned onto um, Chinese cooking and Chinese food at the time. Um, uh, in relation to that anti-Chinese racism and bias. So here we have an um, advertisement from the era um, from a Chinese restaurant on 107 East Markham Street, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't too far away from Ham. Um, uh, here, uh, the uh, proprietor, Tom Wing, promises meals served hot according to order, cheap, um, and so uh, with good, good cooks and prompt service. So here um, you get this, um, again, that push-pull. Um, you know, I, when I was doing my research, I found an interesting little side note that, that um, is not really so much a side note as it is really, um, you know, gee, we could spend a whole hour talking about this. But uh, if you go, um, if you were around in Bella Vista in the 1930s, you might have made yourself, um, uh, you might have uh, visited the Wonderland Cave uh, nightclub, which was this really fascinating kind of uh, nightclub in a cave out, out um, up there in Bella Vista. Well, on the menu was chop suey, right? Uh, Chinese food. So it was Chinese food cooked to a group of hungry uh, uh, nightclub goers. Um, you know, chop suey was this kind of amalgam of vegetables and meat stir fried together with a, with a, uh, cornstarch laden sauce, neither Chinese, wasn't really Chinese, wasn't really American, but again, it's that interesting kind of push-pull, uh, one that is familiar, both familiar, but also a little different and maybe even exotic. So that goes, that, that comes to a really important, um, uh, that gets uh, us to a really important part of, of uh, the history of Chinese in the Delta and also in Arkansas, is the Chinese grocery store. Um, and like I said, um, uh, the Chinese grocery store, this is a photo of uh, Yi Foodland, um, 
uh, Mayor Yi's old uh, grocery store in Lake Village that I took about 10 years ago now, a little more than 10 years ago now. Right, and uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, life in the groceries. Well, you know, the grocery store becomes sort of a major sort of niche economy for the Chinese in the region. Um, by the 19, by the 1940, majority of the Chinese be, uh, in the region worked in the grocery store. The grocery store itself as an institution came at a time um, when there was a decline in the plantation commissary system that allowed for groups like the Chinese Americans um, sort of market opportunity um, to serve underserved uh, populations. So a lot of these grocery stores were in um, neighborhoods that were underserved by, um, by you know, other markets, supermarkets that would later, uh, that would later open. Um, and such there was this sort of niche economy um, that uh, was um, a, a real staple of Delta life. And I know some of you who might have grown up in the Delta, you know, might <clears throat> remember going to your local corner store. Um, and so, uh, and, and it, it may have been run by a Chinese family. And so the grocery store, you know, life in the grocery store was hard. And, you know, this is something that Joe Dan could speak to. You know, it wasn't easy work, but it was honest work. It was, it was, it was respectable work. You know, and like I said, there were ways in which, um, you know, families were able to make a living, send their kids to college, um, um, and um, really thrive in Arkansas and in the Delta. The store itself becomes a way of preserving tradition, right? And so one of the um, uh, examples I give of that is, um, this is a quote from Uma Gion, whose, whose parents own Benson and Company store in Alzheimer, Arkansas. This is a photo from the Library of Congress. Um, and here he, he, you know, in an interview um, with um, a book, if you uh, would like to learn more about the Chinese, the history of Mississippi Delta Chinese grocers, um, uh, John Jung's book, Chopsticks in the Land of Cotton, is a great resource. Um, you know, here he talks, um, he talks about his parents, you know, making salt fish, uh, which is, you know, drying and preserving fish, what they have in their <coughs> yards. You know, they ate a lot of the traditional Chinese foods, which they were able to obtain by mail order, but there were also um, ways in which, um, you know, Chinese ingredients were able to be got, uh, uh, were ordered from Chicago, from Memphis, um, along those sort of railroad um, lines. But they also grew their own vegetables, right? And that's a common story of, 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 of Chinese families growing their own bitter melon or winter melon um, that were just unavailable in the local stores. Um, and here we get to um, lunchtime at, 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 um, at, the, at the back of uh, Mary E's old store. And, and this is one of my favorite photos because I just love, if you look at the, the patina on that walk, you know, they use it every day, used it almost every day. And so it really shows that, that, that history <laughs> really literally baked into that walk. And of course, that wonderful spread that I saw. But the, the grocery store also becomes an interesting place of exchange, right? So in addition to keeping up the traditions of the family, of the culinary traditions of Chinese cooking, there was also a place of exchange. And so if you look at this other picture that I have, you know, in addition to that char shoot pork that CCP talked about, that traditional Cantonese style barbecue pork, what do you have but a nice bowl of lima beans with ham hock, right? Um, uh, not too far from Lake Village in Louise, Mississippi, um, I uh, found a family that was making their own Chinese Southern style barbecue sauce. And again, like Cece said, um, you know, there is this affinity of both the Cantonese cooking tradition um, around barbecue and around pork in particular, right? Um, um, and Southern style cooking that is also, uh, you know, infused with porky goodness, whether it's in the form of barbecued pork, but also pork. Um, in, in the form of smoked pork products. So you have this mix of traditions as well. Um, so I end with, I sort of bookend um, this presentation with Golden Mountain, that allure that the Chinese came to America through the gold rush, um, but then also to uh, the cotton fields of, of, of the Delta. But then I end with the Golden Venture, which is a, another one of those sort of obscure historical events, but I think really um, talks a lot about the
the sort of contemporary mold of Chinese in Arkansas. Um, the Golden Venture was a freighter that ran aground off the coast of New York City in June 1993. It's carrying about 286 migrants, um, mostly from Fuzhou, uh, from the Fujianese prov uh, from the province of Fujian. And today, for the uh, uh, immigrants from Fujian uh, make up the majority share of res Chinese restaurant workers today, and especially in the South. Um, if, so think about the Chinese buffets or the takeouts, and a lot of the labor that goes into making um, your you know, the Chinese takeout that you order um, our workers from Fujian. Um, you know, some of them come um, uh, with appropriate legal documentation, but then others are undocumented and come through a very uh, vast network of, 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 of smugglers that span the globe uh, from Myanmar to Thailand to Kenya to Tanzania to the Americas, which is what the Golden Venture um, Without, which was the route that the Golden Venture took to get these Fujianese migrants to the United States. Some of these Golden Venture Chinese uh, uh, were able to get asylum after their ship ran aground and it was a big humanitarian disaster. Uh, and then they came to Arkansas to cook in these restaurants. And it ended with the Golden Venture because, you know, I think the Golden Venture talks, um, it speaks to the sort of current experience, the current politics around um, Chinese food in Arkansas. You know, as a scholar of food studies and a, and, and, a, and, a, and a professor who teaches about food and history of food, you know, one of the things I have, I, I always tell my students is that food is all about politics in addition to about tastes and, and, and histories. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the Golden Venture speaks to this, um, you know, hunger for something familiar, right? So, you know, a lot of these Fujianese migrants uh, end up working in the sort of takeout counters um, that have now become a, a, a part of the American food landscape, right? Think about the egg roll, think about General Zhou's chicken, right? These are not quite Chinese, although you see, you see the DNA of it in Chinese cooking. You know, General Zhou's chicken, while not Chinese per se, if you go to China, you can't really order it. it there are elements of it that do make it Chinese. But then you also have new varieties of regional Chinese cooking um, that are introduced by this influx of Chinese immigrants. Um, but, um, you, know, um, you know, some of the more popular restaurants that I could think of in Little Rock, for example, Threefold, right, showcases the really complex flavors of Northeast China um, and of the Manchurian region. Um, and, uh, and so um, I think, um, I think it, it goes to show that Chinese food you know, is this, again, push-pull, right? This seemingly contradictory um, hunger for something familiar, but also something new. So with that, um, I'd love to take your questions. Uh, thanks again to uh, Lori for that introduction and for Ellen at HAM um, um, at the History of <coughs> Arkansas Museum for inviting me. And I look forward to your questions. And I also look forward to hearing Joe Dan Yee talk about his experience. Um, you know, which I, uh, which I always love hearing Joe Danny talk about his family's history. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Kevin, so much. Um, I'm looking, I'll remind everybody who's participating, you can put your question in the Q&A, you can type it in the chat, um, and we'll look to answer those. But, um, and when will you finish? Uh, Ellen did ask, um, we did have a question that is, how did you get your interest in food waste? Clearly, you can hear the enthusiasm and the amount of study and research you've been doing for a decade more. So how did you get interested in food waste? Uh, you know, to be honest, it's because I love to eat. I love mm. to eat. I love to cook. My mom, uh, not, not, um, not unlike what Cece said, you know, my mom tells the story of when I was a kid, one of my favorite toys that I would play around with that you could not separate me from was a ladle. Apparently, when I was a, when I was a toddler, I would just sleep with this ladle. I would carry it around. And she says, you know, that I think that I was either going to be a cook or or a scholar. So um, and so I think for me, my interests were, you know, really thinking about how the food gets to the table, right? You know, and, and thinking about the different again, like I said, food is historical, food is political, food is social, food is cultural, right? It's all those things. 
And I think my research sort of reflects that, um, you know, my dissertation that I'm working on um, is looking at, um, it really literally takes the recipes of my childhood, of my childhood family kitchen, and deconstructs it to see how these ingredients make it into this recipe. Um, and I think that's the kind of um, uh, research kind of method that, I, that I've taken to um, thinking about, say, the Chinese, um, the contributions of Chinese Americans to the South, right? How do the, how do Chinese come to the, come to the state, you know, and what are their legacies through the food? And how do the foods that they eat, that they love, that they share, you know, help um, speak about that history? Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think, above all, though, I, I love to eat, I love to cook. So yeah. um, I think that's how I, I really started this um, this path to really thinking about um, food history and food ways. That's right. Well, and you mentioned ladle. I, what I think about, I, I'm a I'm a threefold enthusiast myself. And every time I go there and I watch the ladles, they're pulling the dumplings out with, and they're just not the kind that I have in my kitchen here at home. Right. And so it, it's a it's an interesting story. What's your if you're a cook too? What's your favorite thing to cook? Oh gosh, you know I I love you know I love uh, you know, I grew up it, it, with a family of cooks. Um, so my, my aunts um, are, you know, they run restaurants. Um, uh, supposedly, my mom is actually the worst cook of the bunch, even though I think she's a great cook. Um, so um, I love cooking Korean. But I also have an interesting soft spot for classic French. Um, I have mm. a collection of old cookbooks. Uh, it's one of those things that I collect is old French cookbooks. And so sometimes I like to whip those out and do a you know, whole, whole thing, you know, little Julia Child. Um, uh, She's certainly yeah. a great inspiration. That's great. Well, it was a joy to hear you talk about it and your enthusiasm, even in the virtual space, your enthusiasm left across the screen. So thank you so much for that, Kevin, for joining us. We're really glad you're, you claim Arkansas. You mentioned Arkansas in your bio. We're glad. We know you're out there on the East Coast doing big things, but we're glad to know that you have some roots here with Park us. View, Parkview Patriots, class of 2007. Awesome. So you have literal roots with us. So we're so- And my parents are still there. So I, I visit whenever I can. Uh, oh, good. For holidays. So I'll- I'll have to make sure to stop by Ham and say hi next time I'm in Little Rock. Please do. Yeah, you're part of the Hamily now, so please join us. So, and thank you so much. And our next speaker, our final speaker for the evening, we're thrilled to have him. And Kevin set him up nicely for his presentation. And so we're glad to hear from you, Mayor. We're really glad you could join us. And Mayor Dan. Uh, Jody and Yi, whom some of you already have mentioned in the chat and said, I don't know, Mayor, if you could see the chat, but several people were like, Jody Ann's here. I'm very, very excited. <laughs> Um, we're really glad to have you. If you don't know, Jody Ann is the mayor of Lake Village. He form he used to run Yee's Foodland that Kevin showed us pictures of, and, and we learned a lot about just now. It's a grocery store that operated for decades in the Delta. Mayor Yee, we're thrilled to have you, and now it's your turn. You have the virtual floor to tell us more about your uh, culture and history and how it relates to foodways. Thank you, Laurie, so much, and Alan, and the organization for having this event to see me. And mostly, thank you for letting me be part of it to promote Asians in the Delta. <laughs> well, let me start off. Both my parents are deceased now. Uh, I lost my dad at the age of 91, my mother at the age of 101. But let me just say, growing up, <clears throat> I remember that my dad put in long hours at the grocery store. I remember every weekend, we didn't have dinner till 12, 12 midnight, Friday and Saturday nights. And growing up, you know, my mother didn't know any English. So we would tell our dad, say, Daddy, tell me let's cook some fried chicken, pork chops, or whatever the case may be. And he finally got to a point where he said, all right, kids. Now, there were six of us siblings. My sister is the oldest. She is 88 today. And my brother is the youngest. He is 61. So you can see what the age gap is. But anyway, he would say, whatever y'all want to eat, you go to the ice box and get it, point it out to your mother and tell her to cook it. We would say in English, 
and then she was saying Chinese. And that's how we learned to speak our dialect at such a young age. And, you know, all of us kids, except my oldest sister, we grew up going to Catholic school. So we never saw the racism side like my dad told me growing up. He told me how hard the life he had, how hard it was for him to, uh, he wouldn't accept it to, uh, to go to kids with the Caucasians. He wouldn't accept them going to certain stores. And, you know, growing up, I didn't know how to comprehend all that. You know, I didn't know how to take all that until I got into my, I guess, 30s, maybe, or early 40s, when I started getting involved with uh, Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum. And it was fascinating stories from all the Chinese people in the Delta. And all these stories related to the same, how hard it was for all of us, all of them, to raise their children in the Delta. And back then, there were two groups of Chinese in the Delta. You had your Mississippi group, and then you had your Arkansans and Louisiana group. And I remember back growing up, there were five Chinese stores in Lake Village. Five. And I remember sometimes we were not allowed to communicate or conjugate with other the other stores. And I understood student growing up that we were competitions. We were all competing for the same thing. And uh my dad always told me, you know, how hard life was. And I come to reality was he had a hard time raising up five kids, putting us through education, and all of us getting our degree at the University of Arkansas. He didn't want us to go through what he went through growing up. And when I got involved with the Mississippi Delta Chinese Organization, it was really, really strange to see all these stories that they were all the same. You know, back in the 80s, there were 60 mom pop stores in Greenville, one on each corner. And we all, they all grew up with the same mentality. They wanted to raise their kids and, and get them to college and to go somewhere and have a better quality of life. You know, my sisters, when they grew up, graduated from college, they took off to San Francisco, California. Well, the three brothers, we stayed behind. And we had an opportunity to leave. But, you know, it was something about my parents and the people in the Delta that made me stay. It's because growing up, I never saw that part of racism, hatred, we were always accepted in the Delta. So I never saw that part. And coming back to Lake Village was the biggest, I mean, impact in my life because I had people that were mentors in this community. I mean, I remember one family and we celebrated her 90th birthday uh, a couple of months ago. It was Miss Pat Elliott. And she reminded me that on the first time they invited me to her house, I was like 14 years old. They invited me over for a Thanksgiving dinner. And she stared at me because I did not eat a thing. And she said, Jordan, can I get you something else? I said, no, no ma'am, I'm fine. Well, I was never accustomed or open to that type of food. I mean, my mother cooked Chinese food lunch and dinner. I never knew what a hamburger was back then. It was so funny. But it was like, that was the first time I was open to Caucasian food. And I'm telling you, right to this day, uh, my sister, that's 88, cooked Asian food for lunch 
in Denver every day. And I can tell you, there were some days I would go back in that kitchen, I would fix me a bologna sandwich. And she was so upset that she would say, you're not going to eat? I said, no. It's because we were spoiled. We got the Asian food all the time. And, and some of my Asian friends, that their family they cook Asian foods. So we were spoiled, and they were not. And sometimes when they came over and ate with us, I'm like, we saw them eat, we're like, man, they're starving. But I can see why. Because their families were not cook Asian foods for them all the time. You know, so we are still gifted to have our sister cook us Asian foods twice a day. And to this day, she's 88, and I am videoing her to learn some of the Chinese cuisines because once she's gone, that's it. I mean, a lot of our generations don't know how to cook that food. So, you know, once our elders are gone, the food, the Chinese Asian food is gone. The, all the Chinese Asian cooking that we get, you know, that, you know, you're talking about Kevin, it's gone. The menus are gone. The stories are gone. You know, so I mean, I treasure my sister cooking that and I'm video the Asian, some of the, you know, I guess cuisines. So I will have it for my generation and hopefully I can pass it on to the generation below us so we can keep this moving forward. Because I tell you, I'm so scared that when my generation is gone, that's going to be it. The young generation won't know nothing about Aces and the Delta. And I'm so grateful to have to stay and my brother stay because I think that kept the longevity life of my parents. Because even though we were in our 50s and 60s, a word case by me, hey, we cannot make a decision without parents okay. And that's something that I'm grateful for. And, and I, uh, to this day, if I pass on today, I know one thing. I did the most important thing in my life. If I didn't achieve any other goals, I know one thing. I took care of my parents. And that's one thing I'm grateful for, to have the life to do that. So I am very grateful to have this opportunity. And uh, anytime, Lori, Ellen, that you have this to promote, Aces and Delta, please ask me to because this is a good opportunity for me to promote Aces and Delta. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mayor, so much. It's again, it's great to see your enthusiasm and your love for what you're talking about. And so thank you for being with us tonight. We know it's running late. We did have a, someone who commented um, and said, returning to my home state and driving around Arkansas in the late 70s and 80s, I saw numerous Chinese restaurants in quite small towns and rural places in the state and thought they were run by Vietnamese refugees. Were they actually descendants of the Delta Chinese merchants and restaurant eyes? Um, they, were, was, they, were, they were Chinese part of the Chinese merchants. I know like you had like Hal Joyce and Greenville. They started off with the Chinese grocery store. And now in Lake Village, we have house of, you know, we have a Chinese restaurant was owned by their parents. They have, you know, they had a grocery store. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of these Chinese restaurants that are in the Delta now, they are run by the parents that had grocery stores before they had the restaurants. You know, interesting. So, um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, Lori, it's like, I guess when you had so many Asian grocery stores and they had to find another way to make survive, so mm -hmm. they reached out to another venture like Chinese restaurants, which you did not have a lot of, and so mm -hmm. that's how come they just reached out to the restaurants, you know. Like mm -hmm. Cal Lutz and Lake Village, their parents had the grocery store, Ron Treats from our store, you know. And in Greenville, you had three Chinese families that had grocery stores, and they opened up, like I said, you know, restaurants in Greenville, and uh, they were very successful, very successful. Looking, 
looking for ways to help their families th yeah. um, survive yeah. and thrive. We had yeah. another question, Mayor, which is that when you are craving your favorite, um, what reminds you of your childhood, your favorite Chinese food, what's your favorite go-to restaurant or thing to eat, place to go to get that food when you have one of those cravings? Well, you know, there's not hardly any restaurants around here now, Lori, that I have to go to. Uh, like when I go to Kowloon's, they have a, a Kung Fu chicken that's really good and I like. And I, as soon as I walk in the door, they don't have to ask me. They know what I want, you know? And Lori, it's so funny that you bring that up. In 19, probably 90, I bought my nephew. And he was only like 10 years old to San Francisco. We went to a Chinese restaurant, and he said, I said, John, what do you want? Uncle John, I want an egg roll and, you know, southern food. Well, San Francisco, and they said, what is the egg roll? They don't serve egg roll in San Francisco. That is a southern, you know, food. So you didn't have that, you know? So, I mean, you had traditional Chinese cuisine, you know, that, that like my sister cooks, and like I said, I'm gr very grateful for it. I'm videoing it, learning how to cook it because, like I said, she's 88. I'm grateful, I'm very grateful that she still cooks twice a day. Mm. I don't eat bologna sandwiches in front of her no more. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I'm, I make sure I eat what she cooks. And and uh, like I said, I, I'm very grateful to be born in generation I was born in and the, the times that I, I was in, you know, and, and to handle the long gift of my parents that I did, you know. We have, we have one more question for you, Mayor, which is yes. that, and you can take, I'll let you take your pick. Um, yes. is, it's the one thing you would love to get that you can't get in Lake Village, or what's your very favorite thing to eat? You can take your pick between those two, <laughs> or both. You can answer both, up to you. Uh, what's my favorite dish to eat? Yeah, what's the one thing you want that you can't get where you are in Lake Village, or what is your favorite food, your specific favorite food, the thing you crave the most? Well, the thing I crave the most is lobster, which I can't <laughs> get in Lake Village. You know, so <laughs> I have to go to Little Rock or Jackson, you know, and I love it, cooking that Cantonese sauce. So when I get to Little Rock, I always make sure they all, and I say, I want that lobster and Cantonese sauce, and they would say, that's market value price. I said, I don't care if it costs me a hundred dollars. I want that lobster and that Cantonese sauce because mm -hmm. I love it, you know, and mm -hmm. I trade for it. So I don't get it often, but when I get that opportunity, San Francisco, wherever, that's always my favorite. That's something you always look forward to. Yeah. Mayor, it has been such a pleasure to have you. I've really enjoyed looking Thank at all the so Razorback much. stuff behind you, too. Oh, yes. I'm a <laughs> yeah, avid can... Razorback fan. Been in that program since the start in 1974. I'm a 46 year some, you know, Razorback donor. And they acknowledged me uh, last year. They profiled me as, my, as the first interviewer in the Razorback program. So I was very grateful for that yeah. as well. Your roots run deep here in Arkansas. We're so glad you could join us tonight. It was lovely oh, to hear. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And we're and for those of you, for everyone else, I, I want to take this time and we're I'm clapping for you in virtual space. Our three speakers, our chef who did an amazing job with dinner, Chef Key, and then we had Kevin Kim, and then we of course had Mayor Yi, and it was so lovely to hear from each of them to see their enthusiasm. Now we have a couple of more things before we log off the Zoom. One of them is we have a poll. For those of you who've been joining us on these polls, we're going to find out what was your favorite dish tonight. And you can pick the egg roll, the wonton soup, the, the pork with rice, the collard stir fry, or the buffet donuts. And you can just tell us what your favorite one is, and we'll see. Um, I know what was the favorite in my house. I haven't had the donuts yet, but I think those are going to be a big fan for a big thing for my daughters. But so tell us what your favorite dish was tonight. And we'll, and it was such a clever and inventive menu. We really appreciate the chef for that. And we hope you all enjoyed it. Y'all know if you've done these before, even if it's your first one, we always send out a survey. We want to hear from you how, what you thought of the meal and what you had liked and what things we could do better and things you thought we did well that we shouldn't change because Mark your calendars. We have our very last History of Served meal of, 20, of the Foodway series 
um, November 12th, where we're going to be focusing on the Jewish communities of the Delta. Tickets are currently on sale on the museum's website. As you know, those go fast. They're always the hottest ticket in town. We'll do another thing where we have a Zoom like this with some really exciting speakers for that one as well. Our sponsors for this whole series for 2020 have been the Arkansas Electric Cooperatives, my office. I'm, I'm supporting the logo here tonight and the Arkansas Rice Federation. Oh, we just got the results of the poll and it was almost a top up between the egg roll and the wonton soup pretty close oh. of course we a lot of us like the pork and rice and the collard stir fry and then of course the donuts too some of us may not have gotten to try those donuts yet <laughs> i'm gonna try them as soon as i up here but so we're glad to know that everyone enjoyed the meal um and i'll take this one, last opportunity i'm going to take moderator's privilege i'm wearing a necklace if you can't see that says vote i'll remind you that early voting has started vote for whoever moves you the most who you think is right for our state city and country but please go vote you early voting has already begun and there you can do that at lots of places around the county so Thank you again for coming. Thank you for a great evening. We hope you see to see you November 12th for the History of Serve series of focusing on Jewish communities. Thanks, everybody. Join Thank the family you. if you haven't already. Historicarkansas.org. Bye-bye. Bye. Let me see. No. I don't know where can I get it? Let me see here. Oh, wait a minute.